Christian Parenting. Aloha, friends, and welcome to the Monica Swanson Podcast, powered by Christian Parenting. I am Monica Swanson, mom to four boys, wife to Dr. Dave, podcast host and author of Boy Mom, Raising Amazing, and the newly released Becoming Homeschoolers. Here on the podcast, it is my goal to bring you practical advice and biblical wisdom for raising amazing kids and building strong families. You can always find show notes over at monicaswanson.com forward slash podcast. I'm so glad you're here, and I hope you'll be encouraged. Hey friends, welcome back to the podcast and welcome to week two of my Women's Wellness Month here on the podcast. I'm so excited about these topics. In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to cover hormones, PMS, perimenopause, as well as pelvic floor health. So there's a lot to look forward to. But today, today's a little special for me because I'm going to share some of my personal journey overcoming struggles with food, exercise, and the scale is how I say it. And I'm not going to lie, this is challenging for me, partly because it is a vulnerable story. It's hard to share from your struggles, and I just want to get it right and communicate well. Um, But also partly because I've learned so much, and I just want to share it all and in a way that is relatable to everyone, whether this is your struggle or something different. I just so want to communicate well here, and it's just going to be hard to cover everything I want to say in one episode. So I'm going to have to count on you guys to go over to show notes, leave me some comments, and hopefully we can dive into more topics like these in the days to come. But here's the thing, though it's hard to fit into a podcast episode, somehow I packed a lot into a little book that I self-published nine years ago, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, and that's kind of what I'll be drawing from in today's conversation. And in fact, I'm going to open by sharing from the introduction to that little book. Here's how it goes. If you lie in bed at night recounting everything you ate that day, if you wake up and rehearse what you might eat the upcoming day. Or if you've ever said the words, I'm going to start my diet on Monday. I get you. If missing a workout makes your world feel out of control, or if you find yourself comparing your body to everyone you meet, I feel your pain. If your moods are affected by your weight, or you avoid social settings because you're on a diet or don't want to face the temptation to eat the wrong foods, I've been there. If you have tried diets or taken fat burners or read books hoping to find help, but instead find yourself more messed up than before, I absolutely relate. But I have good news for you. I used to do all of that too, and now I don't. I quit obsessing over food and my body and ended up weighing less and feeling better than I had before. And I believe you can too. Now that's the intro to my little book, and some of you might be hearing that and thinking, nope, that's not something I relate to. This isn't an area I struggle in, and that is totally okay, but I encourage you to stick around anyway. I'm convinced that the principles I have learned can apply to so much more than my own personal struggle, and perhaps you have a friend or a daughter or someone in your life who struggles with their weight, and this could be helpful. I also know that many of you have already read those words because you've read my little book, which is titled The Secret of Your Naturally Skinny Friends. I self-published that book nine years ago, and though the title can throw people off a bit, I get it. The word skinny has become kind of a no-no in our culture today. But trust me, the title will make more sense if you read the book. And also, it's fair to say that plenty of people have told me that the title is what caught their attention. How many people have said, I want to know the secret of my naturally skinny friends. I mean, I have so many friends who eat whatever they want, and they never seem to be thinking about food, and yet they never gain weight. Yet I work so hard, and I can't seem to lose weight, right? Does somebody out there relate to that? Well, the truth is, this book is super short, under 100 pages. Many people have said they read it in one sitting. And yet, all these years later, I look at it and, you know, there's areas I'd love to expand on and talk more about, maybe one or two chapters I'd love to add. But truly, I look at it and I'm like, this is everything you need. It's all there. I really do believe if this is a struggle for you, this book can change your life. But important to note here, the subtitle of the book is A Simple Path to Your Best Body and a Healthy Mind. 
And this is really the key. This is what we're going to talk about, your mind. Now, I love that in just the past few years, there have been more and more books coming out about brain science and the Bible, and I love that topic so much. You've even heard Luke on here talking about you know, brain science and mindset and how it's impacted his surfing career. Well, I geek out on brain science. I love it. And I love that these books have really confirmed for me the process and story that began in my life well over 20 years ago, though I didn't totally understand it or have the vocabulary for it then. Now I look back and I'm like, this is exactly what I went through. And I do love that a lot of people have told me that the way I tackle this topic in my book is different from anything else they've ever read. They say they feel like I was in their head and I get them. And I'm so thankful that hundreds, if not thousands of people have told me that their life was changed after reading my book. So with all of that, um, it's all in the book, but today I want to just share some of my story. And what I always want to do here on the podcast is even if you don't buy the book, (laughs) I hope that what I share will somehow encourage you or give you something that can apply to your life right now. I like to make every episode as practical and applicable as I can. So I think the best way to start is just by sharing from my story. So let's jump in. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s where there was quite a strong diet culture. I mean, to some extent, I think it's similar to today. Sometimes I feel like you know, you're getting older when you're like, yep, I've seen that trend come and go a few times. Like things are packaged with a different name, but it's really very similar. And so I remember the sugar-free phase and then the fat-free phase and then the no carbs phase. And my family is very healthy and active, but you know, like everyone else, my parents were trying different diets. And yet I started my early years as a competitive gymnast. So I loved sports, always have. My whole family plays a lot of sports. I'm, you know, the girl after two big brothers, but I also was a competitive gymnast. So I remember being very skinny and very strong growing up. It was hard for me to gain weight. Um, But about middle school is when my gymnastics career ended. That's its own story. And I just became a seasonal athlete. And that also was about the time I was entering adolescence and my teenage years and when a girl's body is typically changing. So I went from being stick skinny to pretty healthy teenager with some curves and a little extra body fat. And it was during these years that I became very self-aware, body aware. I started dealing with comparison and insecurity and so many of those things that are not unusual. In fact, they're very common in the teenage years. And I can't help but take a moment to just remind parents that in the best case scenario, the teenage years are hard and there are so many messages coming at our kids. And I think this is part of the reason why I always, in all of my books and here on the podcast, you've heard me talk so much about the importance of making sure our kids are grounded in their identity in Christ because the teenage years can be so difficult. And man, I have such a heart for young girls trying to grow up today because I know how hard it was for me and I didn't have the internet and social media and all of those things. And so I just really want to do everything I can to encourage parents to be talking to your kids, that having to be having these conversations because best case scenario, it's going to be challenging. And yet we can make such a difference if we help them understand where their true value comes from, that it's never going to be found in their their appearance, their weight, their popularity, or anything else, but only in what God's word says about them. And we can't talk about this stuff too much, and it can make a really big difference in all of these things. So back to my story, and I'm going to skim over some parts because I just can't take the time to go into all the details. And there are some more elements to even my teenage years that perhaps I'll share another time. But my body image struggles were definitely developing in these teenage years. And then after high school, I went on to college where I decided to study sports medicine. And I think I chose this partly because of my genuine love for sports and fitness and all of that. It seemed like such a good fit for me, but also partly because of my personal obsession and hoping that I might figure myself out through the things I would learn there. Uh, And after college, I went on to graduate school in physical therapy in Oregon, and my struggles continued through all of those years. And again, I'm skimming over these years, but the important point is 
that I gained a ton of head knowledge. I learned about anatomy and physiology and so many things related to the body and the systems in our body, but none of the head knowledge helped me overcome my own inner struggles. And interestingly, there were years in there that I got really lean. I started running a lot. I ran cross country in college and then did some marathons. And yet, even when I was at my thinnest ever, my problems didn't go away. My mind was not free. And that's because none of this really was about a weight or a size. It was about what was going on in my mind. And I hated it and I wanted to change, but I didn't know how. I was envious of my naturally skinny friends, or honestly, I was envious of any of my friends who, whatever their size was, seemed to simply not be that concerned about food or their body. Well, I was halfway through my physical therapy degree when I met my husband, and that was also when I was getting much more serious about my faith and really committed my life to the Lord. And the long story short is that I ended up stepping out of physical therapy school, partly because my husband was about to begin medical school. And there's a really sweet season of getting married. My husband was in medical school. We had our first son. And then we moved to Hawaii for residency, had another son. And life was good on so many levels. But in all of that, I continued to be preoccupied with dieting and my body. And there's no doubt my obsession stole joy from me and my family. I mean, it's really hard to be a present mom when you're always in your own head, right? And especially through those pregnancies, it is really challenging to go through a pregnancy when you don't have peace with all of these things. So somebody out there knows what I'm talking about, but that was super challenging. And then to add to all of that, I was ashamed of myself. I was embarrassed. I felt like this was such a silly issue and I knew I shouldn't think about it so much, but honestly, I didn't know how to stop. And I used to think about other addictions, not that I would want any of them, but I was thinking of like substances that people would just quit cold turkey and how we couldn't do that with food. For the rest of our lives, we have to eat, right? Every day we make choices about the foods we eat and we should exercise. It's good for us. And I love to exercise. So I just felt stuck trying to figure out how to live at peace with all of this. And all I really knew to do was to follow another diet or an exercise plan and just return to those same patterns over and over. And temporarily, it might give me a sense of control because I would be weighing myself every day. I would be thinking about the foods or counting this or shopping for that. And sometimes I would drop a couple pounds and I'd feel really excited. But we all know what happens when you stop dieting or something gets in the way of your plan. I would gain the weight back and usually even more. And then I would go through times of trying to just be free, not worry about my weight, eat whatever I felt like. But that didn't take my preoccupation away. And honestly, I didn't like how I felt when I ate whatever I wanted. And I think it's okay to say I don't like how it feels to carry extra weight. Like I think that's something we need to acknowledge that there's nothing wrong with wanting to be at a healthy, lean weight. And I think sometimes in our culture today, even that is like, oh no, you, you should be happy at any weight. Well, most of us aren't happy carrying extra weight. It doesn't feel good. It's uncomfortable and it's not healthy. My family has a lot of heart disease in it. So I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, I want to be at a lean and healthy weight, but it was how to get there in a healthy way that I just could not figure out. And so finally, it was after my second son was born that I was just fed up. I wanted change so badly and I did not want to keep living the way I had. And I began to just pray that God would show me how I might find freedom. Every sermon I listened to, every book I could find, I would read hoping that perhaps they would have the key to what I was dealing with. And some of these books that I'm going to put in show notes, I wish they were available then. I wish my own book was available then, but I couldn't find anything that spoke directly to this. I just found more diet plans and workout plans. And so I was super frustrated, but I really began to pray like, God, whatever it takes, please just help me to find freedom. Now, there was one book, a study that I did that actually began to open my eyes on this topic. And interestingly, it was a book that didn't mention food or dieting or body image issues. It didn't mention that 
anywhere in the book that I can find, could find, because I was definitely looking for it. But it was Beth Moore's Bible study, Breaking Free. And what I began to understand from that book was kind of just the idea of idols in our life, of strongholds, areas that we could be really stuck, but the truth that God could set us free. And I began to wonder then if maybe there was more to all of this, all of my battles, than just following another plan. What if there's something deeper, even something spiritual that might be able to change my life? And I was like, God, I am ready. I'm willing. I want a new way. I'm I'm even willing to live with extra weight on me if that's what it takes. What I want is freedom and I want peace with you. I want you to be the most important thing. I want to get my mind off of myself, right? And now looking back, I just love that I can see how God answered my prayers. And what I love is how when we are surrendered, when we're seeking God's will first and ready to let go of our grip on whatever it is we're dealing with, he just meets us there. And I think of Matthew 6.33 that says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's a paraphrase. I'm not sure which Bible version that probably a combination. But what I loved is I went back to Matthew 6 to be like, what was going on there? And I love that Jesus was speaking to his followers very practically here about the things that stress them out, the things that stole their peace. He was saying, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. So this verse really does apply to this situation so much that when we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he's going to take care of all of these things. And in this season, I feel like my eyes just began to be open in a new way. I began to ponder some of the people I knew, people who I'd always considered naturally skinny. And it's like, again, my eyes were open. And I tell some of these stories in my book, but one of the people I'll share about here was a babysitter named Christy. And Christy was a college student. She was awesome. She's still a friend of ours. And she had a beautiful figure. And, you know, back then I made certain assumptions like, oh, I'll bet she works out all the time. I'll bet she hardly eats because that's what it would take for me, of course, I thought, to be to have a beautiful figure. And so I'll never forget the day um, she was babysitting. I needed to, I think, go to a doctor's appointment or something. So I was switching the car seat from my car to her car in case she needed it. And when I got in the back seat of her car... I saw something, nothing short of scandalous in in my eyes. There was a Dunkin' Donuts bag and a bikini. And I was like, wait, what? There's no way she would be, you know, eating donuts. Like to me, that was such an off limits food, right? And so then the next time she was over, I couldn't help it. I had to take a peek in the back of her car. And this time there was a Mc. Donald's bag, and I'm pretty sure there was like part of a burger still in there, which was weird. Like who eats part of a McDonald's burger? You finish it if you get it, right? And again, the bikini. And so this just got my wheels turning. And I was like, wait a minute here. Like what is, what's going on? How could this girl be eating such junk food and look so good. She must not diet. So I started to just kind of observe her when she was around. And I know that sounds creepy, but it's true. And it became pretty clear to me that Christy just wasn't obsessed with food. Like when there was food around, she was busy talking and laughing and chasing kids. And she would choose a Coke over a Diet Coke. She had a hot dog instead of fresh fish, I remember. She she just didn't seem to be obsessed over her food choices. And I'm guessing she was a college student. She probably was making choices based on what was cheap, what was easy, and what tasted good. But at the end of the day, it didn't seem like she ate very much. Now, she probably didn't have a very healthy diet back then. And there is a second chapter to Christy's story that's super cool that you're going to have to read in the book. But at that time, she didn't make very healthy choices. But ultimately, she was not eating very much. And it was like blinders came off as I started to consider so many of the people I used to think of as naturally skinny. And I thought maybe it wasn't about their magical metabolism, but maybe they were eating less than I would have guessed. And maybe they did have a secret, the secret of my naturally skinny friends, but it wasn't the secret I had thought of. Their secret was that they were simply not that into food and therefore they didn't eat a lot. Now I'm going to pause here because I know that somebody out there is thinking, no, you cannot tell me this is just about how much people eat. Genetics play a role. Some of us just have slower metabolisms, right? Somebody's thinking that. And no doubt, 
Genetics do play a role. And yes, some of us have faster or slower metabolisms. Absolutely. God has made us all very different. We're taller, shorter, thicker bones, faster metabolisms. Also, there's health issues, right? Um, thyroid issues, other metabolic issues that sometimes can be helped by medicine or uh, different ways of approaching them. But yes, I'm not going to deny that all of that plays a role. But I will say that maybe it doesn't play as big of a role as some people want to give it credit for. And somebody like Christy and other naturally skinny friends, because food wasn't their issue. Now, I'm not saying they didn't have other issues, but it, it wasn't something they struggled with. They didn't see themselves as overweight, so food didn't seem off limits. So it wasn't drawing them the way it is somebody who's on a diet, who isn't supposed to eat a lot, right? Their mind wasn't on it. So it seemed that Christy could kind of take it or leave it. It didn't really matter because she could always come back to it later. And therefore, she wasn't eating as much. And that continued to reinforce just who she was as a naturally thin person, if that makes sense. Well, with all this going on in my head and like putting all the pieces together, I started to think, hey, what if I could become a naturally skinny friend? Like who says this is an area I have to struggle with for the rest of my life? Because that was one of the lies that I had believed was that pretty much the rest of my life, I'm going to have to follow a, a food plan because if I'm not following one, I'm going to be out of control, right? Somebody out there knows what I'm talking about. But I started to question that. I'm like, wait, what if I could change how I think about myself and could give up all this stuff, give up all the diets? And I kind of made that commitment then. I'm like, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to give up on following a plan completely forever. <laughs> And instead, I'm going to focus on my thought life because it was becoming really clear to me that this really went back to my thoughts. I didn't have a food problem. I had a thought problem and that led to a food problem, right? Well, I share all of this in the book by using what I call the thought cycle. And it's really simple brain science, but it's super helpful and practical. And it, I think it'll help you understand how our thoughts shape our actions, which lead to how we live. Whether you're on what I call the thin cycle, which is you know what Christy was on, or some other cycle, I share that in the book and encourage people to really consider where they are on that. Because I know now, and so many other people have told me the same thing. Once you tweak one part of that cycle, it can change your life. And I love that the Bible has so much to say about this, about our thought life. Second Corinthians tells us to take our thoughts captive. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Throughout scripture, there's so much about our thought life and for good reason. It's the most powerful tool we have in every area of life. I'm so grateful that God has given us our minds and the choice and the freedom for how we're going to think, where we're going to pour our energy. And again, this is just a topic I could go on and on about all day. But what I did, back to my story, is I just got really radical about my thought life. And instead of following a diet plan, I focused most of all on my thoughts. I also got rid of my scale and I refused to stare in the mirror another minute. I completely started to just take those thoughts captive and move my mind onto other things. And there's so much more in the book about this process. But one of the important things that people have told me is so helpful is, is that I got really honest about some of the lies that I had believed about myself, brought those to the Lord. I think that's a huge, important step in all of this because most of us at some point in our life have believed lies. So whether it's about your weight or something else, it's really important to take that step and then I replaced the lies with truth, truth from God's word. What is true? That we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that our identity isn't in our body size or anything else, that my self-worth is secure because of God's love for me, and that I can live a healthy and free life without being obsessed with food or exercise or the scale. And then I began to develop a vision for the woman I wanted to be. Not a number on the scale, not a size on my jeans, but a vision for who I wanted to be as a mom and a wife. I imagine a healthy, fit mom, which I think is completely a great goal. Like we should all want to be that. Someone who's present with her kids, not always wrapped up in her own thoughts. Someone who ate healthy foods, but wasn't dieting. I wanted to be someone who could enjoy treats with my kids without it throwing me off or making me feel out of control. And I want to be clear, this wasn't about manifesting. It was about being intentional and practical with my thoughts. 
And with this, of course, you have to be honest and realistic. I'll never be a six foot tall runway model or an Olympic athlete. We can only work with what we've been given, but with the God-given body shape, size, bone structure we have, what do we want that to look like? Who do we want to be for all the days, the rest of our life? And I considered at that time too, things like how much I would exercise, what kind of lifestyle I wanted. Because as a busy mom, it wasn't realistic that I would be doing these obsessive, crazy workouts six days a week. That wasn't who I wanted to be. I mean, yes, I wanted to be healthy and fit. I think we should all exercise regularly. That's a really good choice. But what is reasonable in the season you're in? And even more, what is sustainable? Like, Is it realistic to work out that much when you know you're going to be having more kids and this is what life is going to look like? So I, at that point, actually started working out less than I had before. And for anyone who struggles in the areas that I did, you know that that sounds pretty radical, right? Like, okay, I'm going to go off of all diets, quit weighing myself, and then exercise less. That kind of sounds like a recipe for disaster, right? But I was so determined and almost developed like a little bit of a challenge mentality. Like I can do this with God's help. I can do this. I'm committed to the person I'm becoming and I'm so over my old ways. Now that doesn't mean it wasn't uncomfortable. This was a massive change and it was very much uncomfortable, but I was also excited to try something completely new. If someone had told me 18 years ago when my older sons started homeschooling that one day they would be graduating from college with degrees in engineering and data analytics, I'm not sure if I would have believed you. I wouldn't have known how they could learn all those things since those are not my areas of expertise. Well, thankfully, God provided, and we found some great curriculums along the way, and the curriculum that my boys would say most prepared them for their studies was the Shorman Math Classes found at DiveIntoMath.com. Now, Dive Into Math offers a biblical and historical foundation in their math classes, teaching the why of learning math. They have self-paced courses in state-of-the-art e-learning systems featuring expert video instruction, interactive assignments with auto-grading, auto-recording, video solutions, and Q&A support with Dr. Shorman, which my boys did utilize. Now, Dr. Shorman is from Texas A&M. He is well-studied, so smart, but he's moved here to the North Shore of Oahu, and we've gotten to know him well, and he is an amazing man we have so much respect for. This next year, as Levi starts high school, he'll be taking Dr. Shorman's Algebra 1 and 2, which teaches every concept on the PSAT, SAT, and ACT with over 200 practice questions. You guys, this is a great curriculum. I highly recommend if your kids are interested in college or at least you want to keep that door open, definitely go to diveintomath.com. Check out all that they have to offer. Let me know what you think. Can't wait to hear from you. It's back to school season and life is busy, but you can fuel up your whole family with factors, no prep, no mess meals. Can meet your wellness goals thanks to the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factors fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in, get this, just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. Make today the day you kickstart a new healthy routine. What are you waiting for? With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore. You can crush your wellness goals this month with dietitian approved meals and ingredients that you can trust. Make your day delicious from breakfast to dessert. Stay fueled with easy, nutritious options. Head over to factormeals.com forward slash Swanson50 and use code Swanson50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code Swanson50 at factormeals.com forward slash Swanson50 and you're going to get your 50% off your first box and 20% off next month while your subscription is active. I hope you love it. Let me know how it goes. And one of my greatest inspirations for motherhood and really womanhood is the Proverbs 31 woman. And I love how she's described as being clothed with strength and dignity. And that picture has just always inspired how I want to face my days. Like, do I want to be someone preoccupied and tied up in my own mind related to all of these things? Or do I want to be focused on the task in front of me, on my children, on my community? So I think that really helped me develop a vision for the woman I wanted to be as well. And so somebody out there is wondering, okay, then what did you eat? Like, obviously you're not dieting, but you still have to eat every day. And 
much more about that in the book. In fact, I share five days of what I ate and kind of how I thought through that in the book. But the quick answer for now is I started off by keeping it really simple. I mostly tried to just eat whatever I was feeding my family, which was kind of new for me because I used to you know, be following my own food plan and really particular. But I was like, nope, whatever you feed your family, you're going to have that. You're going to have a small portion. But the key was when I finished a small portion of a meal, I would push my plate away and I'd get busy doing other things and thinking about other things. And, and I, you know, again, when I lied in bed, when I woke up, instead of letting my mind go back to those old thoughts, I would focus them in other places. And I really think a key to this is being busy and thinking about things that you're excited about in life. Other people, praying for people, reading a good book. A few years ago, I created a printable that was, I think it was 10 things to think about instead of food. Maybe it was more than that. It's been a little while, but I'm going to find that and I will share it. I'll make it available in show notes in case that inspires anyone. But there's so much to think about. It's just a matter of retraining your brain. And then if I ever ate more than I wanted to or something that would have in the past made me feel bad about myself, I was like, it's okay because the person I'm becoming is somebody that can overeat occasionally, is somebody that doesn't worry about it if you have birthday cake or a little bit extra on a date night because that doesn't define you. It's just one meal in a much bigger picture. And so I imagined who I was becoming and I tried to think like her and live like her and eat like her and then I'd wake up the next day and I would do it again. And here's a big key. Instead of thinking, oh, am I going to be lighter or feel better by next weekend because I wasn't getting on the scale. No, there weren't short-term goals. It was literally like, who do I want to be in four months? Who do I want to be my, by next summer or by the holidays or by a vacation? So I set that long-term vision, which I think was incredibly helpful. And like I said, this wasn't easy at first. It was very uncomfortable because I had those habitual thoughts. And here's one thing I know, that habitual thoughts can be comforting. Even self-destructive, negative thoughts can bring us comfort if they're habitual. An analogy I thought of since then is my youngest son used to have a blankie, a white blankie, and he would drag it all around and then he kind of used it as a pacifier. He would shove it in his mouth. And I know that's gross, but that's what he did. And I would think, gross, you know, you're getting germs in your mouth. And so every time I could, I'd take it and stick it in the washing machine. But I think how much our negative thoughts can be like that blankie, where we know they're dirty, we know they're unhealthy, they're not good for us, but we continue to um, hold on to them like a pacifier, right? So yeah, at first, stopping myself from those habitual thoughts made me a little bit twitchy. Like it was really uncomfortable. And this is where, again, I come back to brain science. And I think it's so helpful to understand that we have these neural pathways in our brains. And, and it's like a, a super freeway, right? So whatever your thoughts are, whatever your habitual thoughts are, are what you're going to return to automatically because you've developed these deep ruts in your brain. And again, if you study neuroscience at all, you know this. This is proven and people talk about it all the time now. And the only way to change those pathways in your brain is to create new ones. And that does not happen easily. It takes intentionality and practice. And so whatever, whether you deal with this topic or something else, if you have negative thoughts and you rehearse them over and over, you're going to want to return to them. And like I say in my book, it's really hard to follow a diet plan and have it stick, you know, to lose weight or get healthier and have it stick if you haven't changed your thinking, because we're always going to drift back to the person that deep down we think we are. So for me, I became what I call the thought police. I wouldn't allow the old thoughts to come in, thoughts about what I ate or what I was about to eat or what somebody else ate. I chose to just shift my thoughts to other places and to keep practicing that over and over and over. And over time, it did get easier. It became more normal, more comfortable. And eventually, a couple months later, I went to a doctor's appointment and lo and behold, I was at the very weight that I had been working to get it after my kids, the weight that I had dieted and exercised trying to achieve, but couldn't seem to get there. I got there by giving up all of those things. And of course I praised God because I do believe he's the one that set me free and gave me a new way to live. 
But that's also when I was like, oh my goodness, if this sticks, I will tell anyone my story because I knew how many women struggle in this area. And I was like, I want to help anyone who is looking for help. Because one thing I know is that the diet industry preys on people who are sincerely seeking change. And the diet industry makes billions every year. I have a very short chapter in my book about this, but my goodness to think that they take advantage of people who really want change, people who want to be healthier. And they promise, oh, one more plan, more money, more focus. This time it's going to make a difference. And at best, if it does make a difference, it's only for a short time because it doesn't go to the heart of the problem, which is who we believe we are and how we're thinking. We're always going to drift back. And that's why sometimes if somebody does go on a plan and it works and it lasts for a lifetime, it's because they've also changed their thinking. And praise God, sometimes that happens, but so often people end up gaining the weight back and even more. And it just makes me furious because I feel like we're just getting ripped off by the diet industry. So all of that was over 20 years ago and my weight has remained the same. I had two more babies after that all happened, and wow, it was night and day, such better pregnancies, such a better experience, so much more joy and freedom, and I was almost 40 years old when my last son was born, so I think that says a lot, but I'm so grateful. I've continued to walk in freedom. I guess one thing worth noting here is that over time, I've definitely become more interested in just taking care of myself, like what's healthy. I mean, Dave and I have always been pretty healthy people overall, especially Dave who works in the hospital with people at the end of life. Like he sees the the decisions we make, how we feed ourselves, how we take care of ourselves really affects our long-term health. But back when I was trying to just get free, my focus wasn't so much on health. Whereas now that I have freedom, I've been able to go, okay, now what do I want to feed my body? I want to live a long and healthy life. And, and th- I, it says in scripture that I'm, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So how should I take care of my body? So I think that's one cool thing. Once you are free, you can then focus a little bit more on taking care of yourself for all the right reasons. Because I know for me, Years ago, I might have said, oh, I'm doing this or I'm following that plan for my health. But if I were honest, it was probably about my weight. And I guess that's an area that I sometimes challenge people in. I'm like, there are times where you need to follow a plan. My dad has celiac. I have friends who have gut issues. There are times where a health professional will tell you to eat eat a certain way and by all means do it. But I think offering some just big sister tough love, I also challenge people to say, you know, is what you're doing really for the reasons you're telling yourself? Is this for health? Is this because it affects you a certain way? Or maybe is it really about control or about trying to control your weight? And if so, maybe there's more freedom for you than you realize. And sometimes all these rules we follow and all these plans can be a big inconvenience to our families, to other people in our life. So I just encourage people to really consider if maybe you could have more freedom than you think. And to this day, if I'm scrolling through social media and I see something pop up about a new trend or how you should eat in your 50s or how much weight you should lift, how much protein you should eat, there is that temptation to be like, ooh, I want to go down that rabbit trail. And it has taken me self-control to be like, "Uh uh-uh, you don't need to go there. Yes, you can learn what makes you feel best, what's good for you. But for me, in light of my past and my tendencies, it's important that I just don't go down that rabbit trail. And this might be a good time to note too, that when I'm talking about food freedom, I probably don't even need to say this, but I want to make sure it's clear. This isn't about like reckless abandon and eat what, eat anything that sounds good anytime. I always talk about being mindful, being thoughtful, even at the early stages, because our bodies can trick us, right? Sometimes when we're hungry, we're thirsty or we're stressed or we're emotional or we're tired. And so I think being mindful is really important, but that's so different from being obsessive about things. And so that's just some discernment. Maybe it takes some prayer, it takes some just reasonable thinking. One of my favorite words is this reasonable. Um, and sometimes I like to compare this or use analogies to things we're just less emotional about. I mean, I think about other tasks tasks we have to do every day. People say like, how do you cook or meal plan for your family without getting obsessed? And I always say, I try to look at food more like I do my laundry. Like laundry is something I just have to do. A necessary evil, something I have to take care of. But 
I don't find myself dreaming about my laundry or obsessing over my laundry, right? I just kind of go through the motions. And so in the same way, if we can be less emotional about our food, I used to say, think like a man. Now, not all men are unemotional about food, but a lot of guys are. So I think I'm going to try to think more like my husband and look at food objectively and not get carried away with all of that. So sorry. Obviously, I could talk on and on about all of this, but... With that, um, yes, it's been over 20 years. Here I am now in perimenopause, and I don't know what the next few years will bring. Uh, I would like to think if I gain a few pounds during my aging years that I'll be okay with that. I want to age gracefully, but at the same time, I'm also continuing to practice this in this area and in other areas of life, thinking, who do I want to become? And God, give me that vision and help me to live a healthy lifestyle every day towards the person I'm becoming. And again, this is not just like pop psychology. I think it might be Tony Robbins that says, you know, where focus goes, energy flows. But it's true because God made it that way. That's what we have to realize. I love Proverbs 23, 7 that says, as a man thinks, so he is. And I've, I've spoken before at women's retreats and actually said, you know, as a woman thinks, so she becomes. And I know that if you study that verse, if I've got Bible scholars listening, that verse is actually a little bit more complex than that. But still, it's a principle that we can count on. It is so true that we will gravitate towards, that we will grow in the area that we think on the most. So I think that's something we can apply to so many areas of our life. But now as we get near the end of this, because I could talk on and on, obviously, I want to touch on just a couple final points. And one of those is for those of you listening who are Christians, who are in the church, in the Christian community, I think you'll agree that that there's a tendency to overlook gluttony in our Christian community, right? We look at the big sins. We, we talk about so many struggles, but people rarely call out gluttony, but it is a sin and it is an area that we want to avoid. But also with that, I think that there is a lot of people who have idols in the area of their workouts or their food plans. And I love health and fitness. You guys, I still do. Like someday I want to teach aerobics again. I love it so much, but What I will say is when there are Christians who are more excited to talk about what they're eating or how much they've worked out or how much protein they've had or whatever else, if that is more on your mind than your faith, than talking to your brothers and sisters in Christ about the Lord and about what he's doing in your life, then maybe we need to have a little self-check, right? I have a friend who used to realize that she had a tendency to overwork out, like that was too big of a part of her life. So she used to hold herself accountable by saying she could only work out as much as the time she had spent with the Lord that day. And I thought that was really creative and wise. So I think as Christians, we need to be careful in all directions of this, that we don't allow food, exercise, or any of these things to be an idol, but that we also avoid gluttony and that we take care of ourselves in a way that honors God. And I think it's important to note that we are all in a spiritual battle, that we have an enemy who hates us and hates our families and wants to take us down, right? And I know for me, I don't imagine that the enemy could tempt me to rob a bank or cheat on my husband. But could he get me to get all wrapped up in my head about my food or my exercise or the scale? Yes. So I think we are wise to consider if this is an area of spiritual battle in your life. And maybe it's not this, but maybe it's something else, something that is good that, you know, in that's, that's how the enemy works. From the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, he takes a little truth and then he sneaks some lie in there, right? So we can take something in our life that is good or neutral or healthy or whatever, but if it becomes an obsession, then it's sin and it's not good for us. And oftentimes, and this could lead me to a whole nother conversation that I'd love to talk more about because besides just food and exercise, there's all kinds of other just health obsessions out there. And there's no doubt that we are stealing from our kids and our families when we are so tied up in these things that they're taking our money, they're taking our time, they're taking our focus. And we're like, we've got these kids that could really use us. And we're off chasing after 
any number of things. So food for thought there, no pun intended, but let's think about these things and let's ask God to search our hearts and to see if there's any wicked way in us, even if it's in the name of health and fitness, if it is an obsession or an idol or a stronghold in our life, then we want to bring it to him. We want to get right with him. We want to get things in order, keep him on the throne and let everything else fall into place underneath, right? So again, there's a whole lot more in my teeny tiny book that you could read in one sitting. The second half of the book actually is what I call the thought diet. And that's truly for those of us who were so used to following a diet or a plan, instead of telling you what to eat and how to exercise, I give you three thoughts, a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So some are verses, some are quotes, some are just um, thoughts from the book, but people have loved that. So it's just a really practical, simple book. But um, whether you read the book or not, I hope that today's conversation is giving you some things to think about and pray on and maybe be challenged by. I hope it encourages you and I hope you'll spread the word and let people know that this episode is here and I made it to the end. I'm so proud of myself because I was have been really, you know, a little bit nervous about this. So thank you for your support. And I hope that my heart came through in this and that I didn't confuse anyone or offend anyone. (laughs) This has been my story and I praise God because I really believe he set me free. And if I can encourage or help anyone else get freedom, that's what I'm here for. So before we close, may I say a quick prayer for everyone listening? You can join me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for for your goodness and your grace. Thank you, God, that that your kingdom is eternal and that there is so much that we can't even see. Like our life is so small and the things on our mind are so temporal. So I just confess and repent of any area, even now, that I could be lifting things up above you, Um, any idols, any obsessions. God, I don't want to live that way because I know it, it doesn't honor you and it's not good for me. So I pray for anyone listening that needs to bring something before you. Um, also, so anyone listening that just has has a stronghold that they are battling with, whatever that might be, that there's there's hurt or pain or shame or anything else in their life, I pray for freedom. I pray that they would um, be quick to run to you and to just surrender and to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. God, if somebody listening needs to find a friend or a pastor or a counselor to go to, I pray that they would be quick to do that, knowing that freedom is on the other side. I pray uh, that we would just continue to humble ourselves before you and to align our lives with your priorities, God, because I know that's where freedom lies. So thank you for the work you've done in my life. And I pray freedom for everyone listening. I pray that you would just um, continue to guide us and lead us. And we love you so much. And we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, friends, thank you so much again for listening. And if this is a topic that resonates with you, I hope you can get your hands on my little book, The Secret of Your Naturally Skinny Friends. Also, please note that I have a sign-up list for people who are interested in the topic of women's wellness. And this is part of that, um, where I'll be emailing some freebies, some cool things, helpful encouragement, and any news related to this topic. So over in show notes, there's a link to that page. I hope you'll sign up and be a part of that community. I really, really want to encourage you guys. So thanks again for being here. Spread the word about this podcast and have a wonderful rest of your week. Until next time, aloha. Aloha.